So it could go one of two ways. Um, if your pond fills back up and light transparency is an issue, those plants may not germinate again. However, if light transparency pond fills back up, you've got pretty good water clarity. There is a chance that you could get those plants growing out to that contour again, but really you won't know until the following year. And it has a lot of that's going to have to do with that light transparency of the water. And if you have any sort of planktonic algae bloom at the time. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, I will uh, hold for a few more seconds just to see if any extra questions roll in before we get started with uh, the next round of presentations. And all this talks out there for everybody. This first hour is really hitting the basics. So you're going to expect you're going to hear more in detail, dredging, vegetation management, fisheries. We're going to start getting into some of those details. So we're about to jump into. Yep, I don't see any more questions coming in. So we will go ahead and move along. Uh, we, we will uh, hand it over to uh, Tyler Stubbs with the DNR to talk about uh, some proper pond construction and fisheries management. And uh, then after his presentation, we will break for questions once again. So I will let you take it away, Tyler. Okay, can you see my presentation, Cassie? Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, Tyler Stubbs with the DNR uh, was planning on being joined by Ben Dodd, uh, who's the district fisheries biologist here over uh, central Iowa. He's got central uh, seven counties here, uh, but fortunately he had something uh, come up. Uh, so he's not able to be here today, uh, but he is uh, would be a main contact for you, especially if you're in uh, the more rural areas here in central Iowa. Um, as a community fisheries biologist, I typically work with a lot of cities and, and HOAs on, on some of their pond issues. So a few of the things that we'll go through today have, have been touched on a little bit already, and that is things like getting to know your pond. Uh, why is it there? Identifying goals. Uh, if you're building a pond or even renovating a pond, what are some considerations to have? Uh, fisheries habitat, uh, fish management, uh, fish stockings would go in there and then some common problems and solutions and then hopefully some resources that you find, find helpful there at the end. This is just a little bit different than the one John showed. It's just a different water body, but it's the same outline. Uh, this is Mariposa in uh, Jasper County. Uh, but that's the watershed. And so that's everything that is in that red line is ending up in that water body. And so having an idea on what those you know practices are in the watershed, whether they're agricultural or, or urban development, uh, play a big role in this. Uh, you'll notice in that kind of outline I just went through, fisheries management and, and the fish, uh, that was kind of towards the end uh, because everything above that affects what that fish population is going to do and what it's going to look like. Uh, having a water body, if you, especially if you're going to build one with a properly sized watershed, that's a, a very common issue we see in urban areas. Uh, we'd prefer to see somewhere with a, a pond with a watershed to lake ratio of 20 to 1, and that means for every one acre of storage in your pond, it, it is draining 20 acres. Uh, sometimes we'll see ponds built in uh, stormwater ponds with 100 to 1 or 150 to 1. And uh, that doesn't really allow for those nutrients and, and sediment, stuff like that, to drop off before it gets to that basin, uh, kind of, which is what John had, had kind of mentioned in that last uh, question that came up. And so something to keep in mind is not only what it's draining, but how much of it and making sure that that pond is, is built to the proper size of what the watershed's going to be. If you call any of our DNR fisheries biologists across the state and say, I'm having an issue with my pond or I'm going to build a pond, the first question is going to be, what's your goal? Uh, that's going to dictate really the rest of that conversation. Uh, are you fishing? Is it for hunting? Are you looking to manage it for wildlife populations? Uh, are you trying to build a beach? Do you want it for swimming? Do you just want it? To look nice, you want nice, pretty blue water, multiple fountains, that kind of stuff. Are you going to have livestock utilizing this pond? Is it everything? Um, those are all going to be things that 
that you really need to kind of decide on uh, when, when you're calling either not only us, but or a, a private company. Uh, that's going to be the first question they have too, is what what is your goal? What is your objective uh, with this water body? If you're going to build a pond, design is paramount, really, in, in what the future of that water body is going to look like. Amanda brought this up in her presentation that, um, you know, when you're dredging and dredging to the right slopes and, and to the shoreline and that kind of stuff, that plays a role in this. Um, some of the better ponds are steeper sided and deep. And so something like a three to one slope. So every foot out, you're going three foot down. Um, that helps you get to that deeper contour faster, which is where light penetration is going to cut off and you're going to hopefully reduce your vegetation, some of your vegetation issues. We don't want to eliminate vegetation, uh, but we definitely want to uh, hinder some of its, its ability to be excessive. Uh, so kind of a three to one slope, uh, sometimes depending on where you're located and um, not only in the state, but uh, just your soil types in general, uh, you may have to have some sort of bench there to, to make that um, make it stable. Um, keeping that as narrow as possible. That's typically uh, commonly called a, a safety shelf. A lot of times in the past, especially in, in uh, ponds that were built in the late 90s, early 2000s, that shelf was 20, 30 feet out from the shoreline at less than two feet deep. That's 20 to 30 feet of pretty solid vegetation. Uh, so the the narrower that you can keep that band around the shoreline, the better. Um, to give you an idea on what that looks like, that picture there on your your right, um, that's where that bench is. And it's a, a pretty consistent 25 feet. And that picture is from July. Um, and that pond is essentially inaccessible if you wanted to market that as somewhere for, you know, your family to fish or swim or whatever, uh, you can't really access uh, that water body. And so keeping the design considerations in mind, going as deep as you can. Um, and uh, a lot of times we would be shooting for somewhere in that 12 to 15 foot range or even deeper. Um, when you start to get into maximum depths of eight to 10 feet, you do run the risk of some vegetation problems. And I know that sounds strange to say, but uh, curly leaf pondweed is a common um, invasive plant that we have, especially in our urban water bodies. Um, and we've seen that grow from bottom to surface in, in 10 plus foot of water. And so that there is a potential that that kind of stuff can happen. Uh, even if you think you're going deep enough, you might not be. Just wanted to touch on the watershed. And some of this is is really right directly where, where uh, your outflows are going to be in your pond. Uh, that picture on the left is sediment. Uh, this is from an, a pond that has a very large watershed. I know it's over 100 to 1. I don't, uh, it's an urban watershed. And the photo on the right is sand. And so, um, you know, if you own a water body that maybe drains lots of roads or parking lots or, you know, your HOA, if you've got a lot of impervious surfaces, apartment complexes, how that uh, road is maintained during the winter can also affect what your pond looks like. Uh, so making sure things like excessive salt isn't being laid down, but also excessive sand. Uh, that sand ends up uh, coming. This is a pretty sizable sand delta. Uh, they've got their own swimming beach, I guess, uh, in this little uh, HOA pond. Uh, but so how that's managed during the winter um, is important. And that's something I think uh, gets overlooked from time to time. But that picture on the left, that's that outflow. Lots of there's probably sand mixed in there, but lots of sediment uh, from uh, development sites and uh, is going to be something that's all that sediment is now in that main pool in that main basin and it's going to start to uh, promote things like excessive vegetation growth and shallower depths uh, positive drainage <clears throat> making sure that you know what's coming into your pond and um, and being aware of what's above you in the watershed is important, not only from a uh, fishery side of things, but your water quality as well. <clears throat> so this is an example of, uh, you know, an outlet structure. The multi-stage uh, structures that were talked about earlier are fantastic. The biggest thing that we would like to see in some of these designs is that you have the ability to drain the entire pond. Uh, and I know Amanda brought that up. Sometimes the 
um, especially in HOA ponds, we've noticed they have kind of a perched uh, outlet structure uh, so they can drain water partial way. But having the ability to drain the water body completely, uh, especially if you end up having to have some sort of renovation or some issue that you need to drain the pond quickly, uh, having the ability to do that without needing to pay for a pump or, or hire a company to do that is, is important. Uh, but that multi-stage um, drain structure that they talked about earlier, uh, from a water quality standpoint, it's extremely important. And, you know, your hope is that you're keeping that water in there longer. So fish habitat, uh, that's probably the, the funnest part of having, a, especially a, a private pond, uh, is that you can kind of make it your own, right? And especially if you're an angler and having places picked out to have access, to have, uh, you know, this is where I want to fish for sunfish. This is where I want to try to catch catfish. Uh, you can design all those things um, prior to any water being in there. So this is, uh, I believe this is from Aquabi. Uh, State Park uh, down by Indianola. This is just a an example of a pretty diverse set of habitat features uh, that went into to Aquabi's renovation here over the last four or five years. Um, different shoreline uh, revetments, different shoreline shapes, and uh, so you've got different areas for anglers to access. There's catfish hotels or catfish condos spawning reefs, rock reefs, and I've got pictures of some of these here in the following slides. But something to, to think about is that there's habitat in shallow water, there's habitat in deep water, and there's habitat in that middle range. And so you've got habitat for fish to utilize throughout the year. Uh, they're gonna be using that deeper water structure um, during your winter months. They're gonna be using that spawning and shallow water structure uh, during the spring, summer, and fall. And so having those transition periods is, is an important thing to think about if fishing is a priority for your water body. So some examples of, of fish habitat. Uh, this is kind of a combination artificial and natural, right? Because uh, uh, the, the trees are, are a natural uh, product that you may have on your property. Um, there's uh, those concrete blocks, I think, for uh, portions of old boat ramp. Otherwise, uh, things like cinder blocks are, are things that we utilize a lot. Um, I commonly get asked uh, about Christmas trees and if those are something that people could throw in ponds, if it's good or bad. You know, there's really, it's not a bad thing to do, uh, but it also really does not provide much for you. Uh, Christmas trees is a very soft wood and it typically um, uh, really just turns into a stick uh, by the following fall. And so it's not, doesn't have a very complex um, uh, branch structure either. Uh, so, but we would recommend things like cedar trees, which is that lower right photo. Cedar trees have very complex branch structures. They also are pretty hardy wood, so they hold up really well underwater for long periods of time. And uh, so those would be the ones we would, would like to utilize a little more. Christmas trees are okay, uh, but just recommend just be aware that the results of that are, are going to be pretty insignificant. Some other artificial structures are things like plastic uh, pallets, um, the uh, PVC, concrete buckets, uh, flex pipe, uh, lots of different things. The fish really don't care what it looks like, so it's your chance to be an artist a little bit uh, without uh, with very little judgment because they don't care. Uh, but it's, it's something that, um, you know, you can utilize a variety of materials, make it a variety of shapes, and um, place it where you want fish to congregate. That picture on the left that's underneath the large pier, that would be a location that we want people to catch fish. We want them to be successful. We know when there's a pier in a water body, that's where the majority of the fishing is going to take place. And so we want them to be successful while they're there. Some other uh, structures that you could have uh, is uh, you've got concrete blocks and rock. Those are all, uh, very common uh, habitat features that uh, we like to see utilized. Fortunately, that picture on the left, a lot of times we'd rather see the concrete be clean, uh, but there's some rebar sticking out of that one. Um, we would call these kind of catfish condos or catfish hotels, and catfish love culverts. Uh, but uh, it's a place for them to go and spawn. 
catfish are, are like wood ducks, so they're a cavity nester. And so having places like that for those catfish to utilize is important if you want to provide a catfish fishery. But altogether, most of the species are going to utilize all of these types of habitat features. And the last one here is just to show you uh, placement, uh, having them in areas where you want people to catch fish, uh, but also just having different stages of, of where the habitat is. The picture on the left is a, a pond in Ankeny, and you can see they've got them spaced out, uh, and that kind of correlates with where some of the walk down areas are uh, for people to fish. So you're kind of pointing them to where the actual habitat is. Uh, and then there on the right, that is eventually going to be a, an earthen pier. Um, and so people will be standing on top of that and fishing that gravel spawning structure below. And so they're essentially putting the fish right where the anglers are going to be um, and hopefully making them more successful. And then natural habitat, vegetation. Um, so we mentioned vegetation is not all bad. Uh, having it in strategic areas is also uh, something that we try to plan for. Uh, for instance, if we know a trail or the bulk of the access is going to happen on one side of the pond, letting some of that vegetation grow on the on the other side and allowing for that habitat to take place is, is important, and it's not something that hinders any access. And then I believe this is Dakin's Lake uh, in north central Iowa, and uh, having standing timber uh, that's fairly common throughout many of our state-owned water bodies, uh, Three Mile and Twelve Mile Lakes, Brushy Creek, um, and uh, that's again habitat that fish are going to utilize. Uh, that's natural; it was there to begin with, and uh, it was just flooded during the, the the development process. So, fisheries management: what are the goals? Do we want to catch big bass? Do we want to catch little bass? Do we want to catch lots of bass? Uh, do we want to have uh, um, big bluegills? Do we want to have a place where we can just, I can take the kids or the grandkids and we can just go catch fish? All those things are important when you look at uh, what kind of fish stockings and fish management goals that you're going to have for your water body. It's also important to realize that although these ponds are small, they do potentially support multiple species of, of insects. Of invertebrates like crayfish, there's mussels, uh, there's maybe uh, different types of, of fish species that make their way into the pond, um, you know, insects, all that kind of stuff is, is there. But the best ponds are typically the simplest ponds from a fishery standpoint. Uh, bass, largemouth bass, bluegills, and channel catfish, that's kind of the tried and true pond management uh, developed in the 1940s at Auburn University. Uh, that's this is kind of what works. It's easy to manipulate. It's easy to manage. Uh, bass and bluegill readily reproduce in our water bodies in Iowa. So a lot of times it's a one time stocking and, and it's done. Catfish, if the habitat is not there, um, you may need to supplement that population uh, going forward in the future every few years. Uh, but for the most part, this is the population that, that is the easiest to manage and, and you have the best results at trying to balance a fishery. Fish you don't want, common carp, uh, gizzard shad, and uh, something that's very common to see, unfortunately, in our urban areas is goldfish and koi. Um, those are fish species that, that you do not want in your water body. You could even go as far as say things like bullheads too. However, that's they typically have a fairly minimal uh, issue on our small ponds, but common carp, goldfish koi, they root a lot of vegetation, they stir a lot of sediment, um, and gizzard chad are uh, problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, in our small ponds, though, they do like to die during the winter, um, especially when you get into northern Iowa. But those are, are kind of your main problematic species that you'd want to stay away from. So when you have your pet goldfish, or your koi pond and you, you want to get rid of those, uh, your local private pond or public pond is not the location for that. Fisheries management uh, and harvest, people, that's probably the hardest thing. The three golden rules of pond management are you, you have to build it right, you have to stock it right, and you have to fish it right. 
and fishing it right is definitely definitely the hardest thing to get accomplished um you need to harvest fish from these these ponds uh especially bluegills you can harvest those essentially at at will uh bluegills are a species that are going to reproduce multiple times throughout the year and so um your your biggest worry is typically them becoming overpopulated Largemouth bass is a species we typically don't harvest a lot of because they're the ones that are helping you manage that, that panfish population. And catfish are probably the easiest to manage because they're likely not reproducing. And so you have a pretty good idea on what's available for you uh, as you go forward. Crappies are a species that I commonly get asked about. Um, we typically do not recommend stopping stocking crappies in small water bodies i'd say less than 25 acres um, a few reasons for that one is that uh, they overpopulate pretty quickly crappies are one of the first species to, to spawn uh, during the year in a small pond environment and uh, when they are about to uh, be at the point where they're switching over to eating live fish uh, that's when we see a lot of our bass uh, being hatched <laughs> and so they can be detrimental to the bass population, and then they're not a sufficient enough predator to manage your bluegills for you. So uh, they can kind of start this poor domino effect. One interesting thing about crappies is that they do that. They become very overpopulated. They get to about six or seven inches and stop growing. And we've noticed that a couple of years of that, they eventually all die. And so and then you're left with a, a fish um, kill issue. Uh, that picture on the left is a good example of what you would want to see in a pond and it's not easy to accomplish <laughs> but that is what you'd want to see you'd want to see multiple size classes of your two main species of fish uh, which is going to show that you've got food for those bass at each life stage and you've got uh, bluegills that are maintaining themselves and being sustainable uh, through multiple years some common issues uh, fish kills uh, are easily the biggest problem, especially late summer. August is a big month. Uh, when we had this string of 90 plus days with very little wind, uh, high sun, extremely hot, staying hot at night, uh, we saw water temps in some of our water bodies hit the low 90s. And that, a, that is just not sustainable in these small ponds. And sometimes that uh, will cause fish kill issues due to heat. Oxygens are probably our biggest issue that we have throughout the year. Uh, that can be through um, real dramatic changes in weather. That can be through um, vegetation die-offs. Um, oxygens probably are most common. I think a lot of people really want to assume the worst that, uh, you know, there's been some sort of chemical spill or something along those lines. But the vast majority uh, that of kills that we see are oxygen related or they're related to overabundance. And so there's just too many fish species in, in that system. That's where I know John brought up blowing grass clippings in the pond. You know, those are nutrients that are, are gonna decompose and die and, and suck oxygen out of the water body. We see the same thing throughout the winter. Uh, when we have long drawn out winters with heavy snow cover, um, we can see ice uh, under the ice fish kills. If we have uh, lots of vegetation, especially green vegetation in the fall, going into where we're going to be covered in ice, uh, all that stuff decomposes underneath the ice, and uh, the oxygen is going to go to zero. And so having that vegetation managed is important not only throughout the year, not only throughout your, your main fishing and access months, but it's extremely important through your winter months too. Uh, fisheries renovations, not necessarily a problem. Sometimes I guess problems are what leads to the renovation, uh, but there's some things that, that need to be taken in, into account when you do a fishery renovation. One is, where's the water going? Uh, what is going to happen to the fish? Where's the sediment going and how are you getting it there? <clears throat> and um, if there's ways to get help to do that safely uh you know where the sediment is going is important uh you know is that are you hauling it somewhere is it being pumped somewhere uh do you have the proper permits to do that um do you have 
you know, approval and all this kind of stuff. There's all, there's a lot of, of tape to go through for that. From the fish standpoint, you also need to take in, into account the fish. And we see this kind of being a misstep in a lot of pond renovations that uh, those those fish populations, they have to go somewhere. And so there's a few different options. Um, they could be uh, picked up and, and taken to a sanitary landfill uh, if that landfill accepts uh, fish. There's um, ways to bury them. There's ways to um, compost them. You can also leave them in the basin uh, for a period of time until uh, the fish carcasses are decomposed. Um, but there is uh, the best thing you can do is either contact your local fishery staff and or your local uh, field office staff um, to not only let them know that this project is happening, whether it's public or private, but to also um, figure out what your options are on your fish disposal. Having a fish disposal plan is uh, vitally important and it keeps you out of trouble. Uh, things like, I get questions on things like frogs and turtles, typically not a huge issue, you know, they're just gonna leave, uh, but there's typically some concern that, um, you know, the turtles are gonna be high and dry or whatever, uh, but those species typically just leave the system. And so that's not uh, usually a concern. Um, a lot of times you're just draining it through pumping or, um, you know, you're, you're notching a levee. Uh, if there was a chance where you just need to restart the fish population, there is a pesticide called rotenone that we use from time to time. And that's a way to eliminate that fisheries population that's there. Um, the uh, one thing I wanted to mention too is as far as fish transfer or fish rescues go, those, those are not things that we would recommend uh for a number of reasons one you can see that one photo those people are are out in in you know deep mud uh that can become unsafe um so that can be an issue it also leads to the potential transfer of those fish to other water bodies um outside of their watershed um sometimes it's our public water bodies which we don't appreciate and it's illegal to do uh but when you run the risk of transferring uh invasive species um you run the risk of misidentifying what fish species it actually is and removing an incorrect fish species. Maybe you think it's a channel catfish and it ends up being, you, you just transfer lots of yellow bullheads or something along those lines, or you thought they were minnows and actually end up being common carp. Uh, so it just potentially leads to a lot of issues that can happen um, should you do a, a fish transfer. If you do happen to have a fish kill, um, you can pick those fish up. But those fish typically, especially in the summer when we see the majority of our fish kills, they're going to decompose and sink within three to five days. And so it's usually not something that um, you're going to stop and it's naturally going to take place and, and take care of itself. Some helpful resources. Uh, the IOD on our website, we've got quite a bit of pond management information on there uh, for you to utilize. Um, no matter where you live, I assume the majority of the people out here are, are from Polk County. And so you would either be contacting uh, Ben Dodd or Andy Odding in Boone or myself uh, for pond management issues. Um, if you do live across the state somewhere else or you've got, um, you know, your, your uh, associations have partner associations in other areas of the state, um, there are a list of our biology or biologist contacts and staff contacts across the state uh, on our website. The Nebraska Pond Management uh, Guide. Uh, so Nebraska has a really uh, handy guide on their website for pond management. It's one that uh, we typically, when people call and ask a lot of questions on maybe new ponds or uh, you know common issues, the pond management guide that Nebraska has is, is really great. And uh, it's something that we would recommend you look at. Um, there's a number of private pond consultants uh, across the state, aquatic vegetation specialists. Um, there's a number of private fish hatcheries. Some of these are all in one uh, where you could buy fish, they'd manage them and they would uh, work with your vegetation issues for you. Um, there's uh, the private hatcheries are licensed here in the state and there's a list of those on our website. I wanna say there's maybe six or seven. Um, that's not something I talked a lot about, I guess, is that the DNR does not stock private water bodies. 
Uh, so you would not be able to purchase fish uh, from us if it is a private water body. Uh, your local NRCS office uh, can be helpful when you're looking at pond design, um, things like engineering, uh, and not only helping with engineering, but helping you may potentially find an engineer. Uh, the Pond Guy website, there's multiple pond management forums online uh, and, and Facebook groups to help with pond management, especially in our, in our urban areas with uh, HOAs. Uh, so hopefully you find those resources helpful. I'll flash my contact information up here real quick before I hand it off to Jason. Uh, I'm located in the Wallace Building downtown uh, for now. I, don't know, I guess I'll be somewhere else here in a few months, but uh, for right now, I'm in the Wallace Building. And then uh, Ben, as I mentioned, he's the district biologist over this area, and he's located out of Boone at Ledger State Park. And uh, I'll handle some questions there at the end. And we'll switch it over to Jason to talk about aquatic vegetation management. Okay, um, before Jason gets started, we'll go ahead and answer some fish questions because okay. we do have quite a few. Right. Um, and also I wanted to uh, share with everyone that we will gather these resources and everyone, all the presenters contact information and share it with you once we send you guys the recording of the workshop as well. And I will also send you a link to Amanda's video in case you wanna watch that outside of the workshop. So um, I do see a plant question here. I'm gonna go ahead and leave that until after Jason's presentation. But uh, the same person asked about fish, are the native predators of the big three that could be introduced could, could be introduced to help native population control? Kind of like the Yellowstone wolves scenario. So is that question in relation to another predator besides bass? Andy, can you elaborate? Oh, he said yes. Okay. I mean, yeah, you could add multiple other species in there. <laughs> um, you know, walleyes, northern pike, sometimes those fish are just not going to reproduce or reproduce at the rate that you want them to. Um, the more sp species you add in there, the more complex the system gets and um, the less likely you are to be satisfied with the outcome of that. Um, you know, sometimes if you've got one scenario, I guess I would bring up, uh, is some of these old borrow pits and mining pits, you know, Gray's Lake comes to mind. Gray's Lake is a location that, uh, does get some river access, um, as it gets flooded from time to time. So there's multiple different species in there. That's a location where we've really seen a uh, hybrid striped bass, uh, be effective. Uh, but I guess the issue is when you start adding in those other species, something else is going to uh, kind of be on the decline, I guess. Um, you know, if you were to remove bass and just focus on walleye and hybrid striped bass, uh, your bluegill population is likely not going to be sufficient. It's going to become overpopulated and, and full of small fish because uh, they're just not going to be managed properly. And so, I mean, you could do that, uh, but your, you know, your best recommendation, I guess, is to keep it simple with those those three species. Okay. Are there any natural or artificial ways to help keep ponds cool during heat waves? Help keep ponds cool during heat waves. That's a really good question. Um, I wouldn't say to keep them cool. I mean, there's ways that can help through um, aeration, um, and, uh, and by aeration, I'm mainly talking subsurface aeration is a way to kind of keep some current and water moving. Uh, fountains are an option, but they typically end up causing more problems than they, they cure. Um, especially if you've got any vegetation issues, they get clogged up right away. They also don't move a whole lot of volume of water. And so having some sort of proper aeration system in there uh, can help keep that water moving a little bit. But as far as the temperature goes, you're kind of at the mercy of Mother Nature on that. I will add Tyler and whoever asked that question. We did we recently did some studies on some streams about the and they noted some benefits of water temperature with shade from trees. Now, obviously, you don't want trees on the dam, but perhaps that'd be something to consider. I've I've never uh, like we've never looked at that for ponds, but it was something that came up in a recent stream study. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see shade keeping it. Um, you know, change your water temperatures in certain areas. Definitely an option. 
Steve Conrad, he wrote a nice summary in, in the comments too, where he talks about the heat from the watershed. And if the water, you know, also if the water's coming off impervious surfaces yep. and it's very hot that, you know, practices upstream could help that too. But there's a link in there for some more info. Yeah, that was actually just coming to mind, Jennifer, when we, I was thinking about other fish species. You know, we've tried yellow perch uh, in some of our urban water bodies, and we've really struggled uh, because the water temperatures remain consistently high uh, because that water's typically running off of shingles and concrete, and uh, especially in the heat of the summer. And so sometimes we've struggled with those populations just because of their heat tolerance, uh, because that water is coming in abnormally hot compared to maybe some of our rural water bodies. All right, thanks everyone. Next question. I've heard about the use of snails for algae control and supplemental food supply. What experience have you had with this? I've had none uh, with snails. Um, Maybe our main snail issue in a lot of our ponds are invasives <laughs> with uh, things like Chinese mystery snails. Um, I don't know, Jason, have you had anybody use snails before? Um, can everybody hear me first off? Okay, I just had a microphone glitch. Uh, I have uh, not heard of much success using snails for algae control. Um, and I have the same concern Tyler does. A lot of our snails are invasive snails that we're getting in our ponds. All right, thanks. Um, next question, are there any non-traditional pond fish species that do very well in Iowa ponds? Um, it depends on the location. Um, I have definitely seen some ponds with some really nice crappies in them with yellow perch. Red ear sunfish is a species I think gets overlooked uh, in a lot of our, especially where we're at around I-80, um, a lot of our ponds south of us in southern Iowa have red ear sunfish. Um, there's some ponds here in central Iowa that have a good pumpkin seed population and, and they're growing to pretty large sizes. And so I think there's definitely some options out there, especially branching out into some of the panfish. Like I said, the crappies, and I, I mentioned this earlier, the crappies are an option, uh, but they come with a potential consequence too. Uh, but if you stay on properly managing them and harvesting them, um, you could potentially produce some good crappie fisheries, but red ear sunfish and pumpkin seed are, are two species that definitely come to mind. 